Welcome back to the Home Lab, and today we're going to look at a retro but once incredibly common data storage method. It's the IBM 80 column punch card and some interesting variations of it. When I was at school, we actually had an ICL mainframe computer in the ICT department, and those wall-mounted tape drives and absolutely huge whirring hard disks left a lasting impression on me. And since then, I've always been interested in retro computing technology from that period, and I've got quite a collection of items. But today, I want to share one of them with you, the IBM 80-column punch card. Having a bit of knowledge about old computer history is not nerdy at all. In fact, it explains how we got to the here and now. And you might have seen my videos on core memory. Once you've got a bit of understanding of computer history, you should be in awe of the technology that we have now. And I certainly am. What we have at the moment would have been totally unthinkable just a few years ago. So with that in mind, I thought we'd look at one example of computer storage and data handling technology. And that's the ubiquitous, or at least it was for the time, punch card, and particularly the IBM 80 column version of that. Punch cards, whether individual cards or in a long chain or reel, have been around for a very long time. Here's an example of a reel of not punch card, but it's more like strong tracing paper used for player pianos. And these reels are still manufactured today. There were many pioneers in the field, but notable ones were Joseph Jacquard, who at the beginning of the 19th century used punch cards to fully automate textile weaving machines. Charles Babbage wanted to use them to control his mechanical computers, and Herman Hollerith devised a system to store and analyse data famously using punch cards with great success in the 1890 US Census. It was his company that finally became IBM, the subject of this video. Punch cards with their hole punched codes had two main uses. Firstly, the holding of data that could be sorted and analysed. Cards were used for manufacturing control, inventory control, technical drawing databases, stock control, payroll, general ledger and personal records. They could be sorted, collated, acted upon mathematically, and used to generate useful output, such as account summaries or customer invoices. Secondly, cards could be used for computer programming, where one card was used for each line of code. The COBOL programming language was typically used for business applications and Fortran for scientific ones. IBM settled on a type of card in 1928, which is known as the 80 column card, named thus as it has 80 columns across its width, with a corner cut to allow them to be orientated correctly in card readers and sorters. IBM used rectangular holes, which became the norm, as they could be packed more densely than circular holes that had been used previously. In the mid 20th century, Literally tens of millions of these cards were made a day as their use was so widespread. You might be interested in looking up Lyons, the British cake manufacturer, who was an early adopter of punch cards with its Leo computer. Here's a card that holds a small portion of a computer program. And these rather unusual aperture window cards, apart from having the usual punched holes to store collation of information, contain drawings and technical information onto a piece of microfiche. I have some examples from the US Department of Defense here, which are from the late 1970s and early 80s. Far from containing nuclear secrets, these have information about electrical components from Texas Instruments, specifications of printed circuit boards, and even technical details for weldless chain links, as well as some part numbers for a slide assembly made by General Electric. One thing to note is that if you hold up a group of cards to the light, you'll notice that a number of holes align, showing that these cards all belong to one form of filing group. With the exception of the microfiche, 
It's only the punched holes that carry the information. So any overprinting such as user logos, numbers or computer code are only for the operator's convenience. This was ignored by the card reader. Right, let's have a quick look at the ubiquitous IBM 80 column Fortran punched card. So uh, the first thing you'll notice, there are some very small numbers along here, 77, 78, 79, 80. Those are the 80 columns, which is why the card's called the 80 column card. Then going down this way, you'll notice 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's 10 rows. And then rather confusingly, row 11 here and row 12 there. So it's got 12 rows on the card, but they don't necessarily run in order. You'll also notice it's overprinted and the overprint was purely for the user's convenience. The computer didn't need to see that at all. All it saw was the holes in the card and it picked those up with electrical brushes that would pass through or optical sensors. Now, uh, the card's broken up into various regions, as you'll see. The data is generally here in row zero to nine. And then row 11 and 12 is used for some extra bits that are used to interpret how this data has been punched in the card. It allows for more options for the same punch holes. And finally, there's an area over here, and that was used generally for collation data, which allowed you to um, sort the cards and particularly put them through a card sorter if you dropped them and needed to reorder them. If we're going to use these cards to store data, we clearly need some kind of coding system. And binary would be no good, because imagine you wanted to store the number 255. Well, in binary, that would be 11111111. So you'd end up with so many holes in the card next to each other, the card would be um, sort of so physically unstable that when you fed it through your IBM 2501 card reader attached to your system 360 mainframe, the card would just jam or tear. And they did go through very quickly, you know, sort of um, hundreds of cards a minute. So uh, we need a different system. And there are a number of coding systems invented, but uh, one of the common ones was a Hollerith coding system, where, because we weren't going to use zero, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, we used to store um, bits of data, as it were. And then uh, row 12, 11, and zero were used to put an extra hole in, and that allowed us to store a different character, depending on whether the hole was there or not. And that coding system worked really well. And it meant that normally, with the exception of the rows up here, you'd only ever have one or two holes in any uh, column. So the card was actually quite strong. You could, of course, store zeros if you wanted to. And there are two examples on the card here, these two zeros. But you'll notice that whilst the zeros on uh, this row, row zero, are punched out, um, there are no other holes in those columns, especially in row 11 and row 12. So the reader would recognise that those were data zeros and not zeros that are used to decode other punched holes below them. Here's an example of an actual Fortran programming card, and you'll see it's broken up into four distinct regions. The first five columns were used for the statement number. So you'll see here it's 1100, so 1100. And here's probably the next card in the stack. I'll just move that one out of the way so you can see through to the holes. And this is 1200, so 1200. Uh, the next column, which is column six, if you look at this card, is used for the statement continuation. So if you remember, this isn't actually part of the program. So if there's something written or just some text, etc., if it continues along the card into um, this area here, which is 7 to 72, which normally uh, carried the program, you'll notice some holes punched in column 6. And that means we've got a continuation of the statement. If we go back to this card, if you remember, here is the statement number 1200, then there's no continuation of the statement. There's nothing punched out on row six. So we know that everything from row seven to row 72 is computer code. And there printed on for the operator to see is one single line of code and all the punched holes that represent these letters and numbers. And we'll come to that in a minute. We'll decode some of it. 
And then over here, um, this last bit for housekeeping uh, functions of the card. So that's row 73 to 80. And you could put all sorts of things in there. Um, the order of the cards, which card it was, etc., um, which helped you sort them. But that was completely ignored by the computer's compiler. Here I've drawn up a table to show how coding was achieved on these cards. And it's really quite simple. If you look along the top here, these are holes that you could punch out. So you could punch out row 12, row 11, row 0, row 1, etc. Um, so if you did only row 0, if you only punch that out, you would be having a 0. There's actually an example of it here and an example there for those two zeros. However, if you punched out 12 and 4, so that's the top and then the number 4, you'd be storing the letter D. So let's have a quick example here. Uh, there's the letter W. So if we go down, we've punched out 0 and 6. So if we punch out a 0 and a 6, we code a W. And uh, there were also some multiple ones here as well. So if we wanted a particular type of bracket here, we had to punch out 2 and 8. And if you look across, also 12 as well. So that was a maximum of three holes punched out. But that did mean that you could get a whole range of characters. But you might notice there's only uppercase letters. So here's your exam test. Let's put this card on here. And you'll notice that it does have the uh, numbers overprinted on it. Uh, but we've got a line of code here. And you'll notice that if I was to cover up that letter E, this is row 12. Come down here and that's row 5. So what's the character that is recorded if we punch out 12 and 5? Well, row 12 and 5 and there's the E. So we could theoretically take a card and cover up all of that text that's printed on the top, but we'd still be able to decode what's stored on the card. Right, no cheating by looking back at the last bit of video. What's the last character on this card? Well, you'll notice we've punched out row 11, row 5 and row 8. So that's 11, 5 and 8. So 5 and 8. And row 11, you see that goes to 11 there. So the character must be a closed bracket. And there you go. There's the closed bracket. Everything about working with these cards, if some of you remember, was frustrating. And you had to type in the data that you wanted yourself. And if you made a mistake, it was quite difficult to correct it. You had to start the card again. And if you didn't notice this mistake, you were in big trouble because the cards would go into the mainframe reader. And then what would come out was an error message. And you'd have to sort of start again and queue up and wait for your cards to be read. Um, they were hand punched typically in the uh, 029 IBM punch and that had the advantage of printing on the tops of the cards what you'd actually typed in so you could check it. But again, the reader didn't need any of that. It just needed um, the holes punched in the card, um, not the typing on the top. That was just for you to be able to see what you've done. Um, I did actually see a photograph of a female operator loading some of these cards into a card reader and she had really dangly uh, ribbons on her sleeves. And I thought, gosh, the risk of her getting dragged into the machine. I hope that never happened because if it did, you get completely the wrong kind of output. I did briefly mention the disaster that was dropping your whole deck of cards with your computer program in order in them. Now, I know these are blank cards, but to show you what people did is they often got a black pen and drew a diagonal black line from corner to corner on the side or the end of the cards. So if you did drop them, you could then tip up the cards on their side, get them all the right way around because of the cut out corner, usually the top right, but it could be the other corners. And then you could look at that diagonal line and begin to slot the cards in and get them back in order. And hopefully you hadn't missed your place in the queue to get those fed into the mainframe and to get your computer program run. As an interesting little exercise, how many cards would we need to store this video if it was at all possible? Let's say the video is about one gigabyte. That's a thousand million bytes. 
Each line on the card can store one character and 72 lines are available for this data. In the ASCII binary coding system, each character is represented by one byte of data. So, a thousand million divided by eight is 125 million characters or lines needed. That divided by 72 is about 1,736,112 cards required. With a card being 0.18 millimeters thick, that would be a stack of cards about 313 meters a third of a kilometre tall. The IBM 2051 A2 card reader that could read a thousand cards per minute would take about 30 hours to read the data in this video, though it does seem to have taken me that long to make it. By the way, are any of you old enough to remember multiple choice exams at O level where you shaded in a small box to record your answer with a pencil? This is a form of punch card without the punch. That would be far too noisy in an exam hall. As an aside, I'm old enough to have some of my data stored on punch cards. A rather strange thought, which makes me wonder, where are those cards now? And do they still exist? Before we finish, it's worth mentioning Simeon Korsakov, who in the 19th century was probably the first person to use punch cards in his homeoscope for data storage and analysis. His work reminded me of the work of Alan Turing a hundred years later, using punch cards and needles to crack codes at Bletchley Park. You might have seen the fantastic game Turing Machine, which whilst not based on a Turing machine, uses punch cards to help one break codes, and it's a game we really enjoy playing. So I do hope you enjoyed that video on a now obsolete technology, the IBM 80 column punch card. And do let me know in the comments if you know of any mainframe computers that are still using these things. If you like this sort of video, um, also leave me a comment because I've got lots of other retro bits of computer technology that I'd love to share with you. Do stay to the end of the video because after I finish, I often cut in some bits uh, that I haven't used in the main body of the video. But I'll be making another video soon, and whatever happens, do please join me then.